Welcome to October the 8th, 2020, the first and last time that this day will ever, ever happen. And we get to make this day any way that we want to. I'm Lauren Foster. I'm a happiness teacher and I'm your host for the How to Choose Happiness and Freedom Show. And I am so beyond excited about my guest today. She's Karen Flaherty. She is the best selling author of Getting to Know You all about human design. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So say hello, Karen. Hello. Hello. Hi. It's so nice to be with you. I'm so happy. I'm, I'm, you're, as I've said everywhere, you're my new favorite person. I'm so happy that I met you. Um, Karen and I met because we are both authors in a book project called The Art and Truth of Transformation for Women, which is going to be released on October 20th. And that's the day that you want to go and buy the book. Don't go buy it now. Um, <laughs> buy it on the 20th because that date will be 99 cents on Kindle and you'll get 35 plus free gifts with this. These will include personal coaching sessions, um, ebooks, video series, courses, all kinds of priceless free gifts will come with this on that day only on October the 20th. So don't worry, I'm going to remind you again. But that's how Karen and I met in this amazing group of women who are just, you know, collaborating to create this amazing book. So welcome, Karen. Tell us about you. Tell us who Karen Flaherty is. Oh, thanks, Lauren. And thanks so much for inviting me to be here. I really appreciate it. Um, it's always fun to talk to another author and, and somebody who appreciates that we're all in this the midst of transformation, right? And so the biggest, I was happy to be invited into the book also because it allowed me to tell um, actually a very um, dear uh, story of mine, a very you know, I hesitate to say now, but vulnerable story um, in my life that led to the transformation that led to human design, right? So um, it's all, you know, when you kind of look back at it, it's like, wow, all of that happened. And I uh, really wasn't, uh, you know, yeah, I was the butterfly uh, at the end, <laughs> but in the middle, it was a little messy. And so you, you get to go through this entire transformation. I was, I started out in New Jersey, <laughs> the oldest of six kids, big family, um, not a lot of money, and um, but education was really important to my parents, to both my parents, because neither of them had graduated, had gone, well, my father went to college for a while, but he didn't graduate um, after the GI Bill, so um, education was important to them, they knew it was their, the way to get, making more money and, and having a better life, and so they wanted that for all of us, so for that, I'm always grateful. And then um, I, I did get a scholarship to a great university. I went there, um, I, I graduated, but I just wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. I'd started out pre-med, like a lot of other people at <laughs> and um, really pretty much dropped out after biochem. And that was enough of that. Um, so I went into uh, hospital administration basically and took a lot of courses in that. And so that was, I, I took all the graduate courses I could in that, um, graduated and then um, couldn't find a job because it was 1978 and we were just getting into a little mini recession, I guess. Anyway, um, went into retailing, um, a bunch of other jobs in New York City. And, um, and so kind of worked my way through, um, always listening, uh, in a way, listening to my gut, but of course, listening to everybody else around me too, right? Who, you know, everybody else had a different opinion about what I should be doing. It's like, Karen, you're right. You should be doing, you should be more than a secretary. You should be more than this. You should be more than that. Meanwhile, in 1978, if you couldn't type and you were a woman, it didn't really matter what else was up here. Right. <laughs> and what else was up here was not very happy about what was going on with the typing. Right. <laughs> Everybody right. graduated from a, a great, wonderful university. It was like, this is crazy. So I, um, you know, basically plotted my through and plotted my way through and worked my way up and, um, but never really got to the corner office. You know, I got great, um, had great, um, jobs, really interesting people. Um, I loved working in New York City. I loved the travel. I loved the limos and <laughs> wonderful dinners and all of that stuff. But that gets tired after a while, you know. And so uh, I, I finally left the city. I was, I got married um, by that point, um, but that took a while too. <laughs> um, I didn't get married till 37. And, uh, and, then, and then found my way into um, basically remote positions where I could work at home. And um, we, 
um, I'll just say quickly that we couldn't have children and so we tried to adopt and we had two foster children for a year and unfortunately the adoption didn't work out so they had to leave us and that's what the story is about right. in the book. So getting past that and getting, you know, kind of getting back to work and trying to find something else um, that I was really passionate about was kind of elusive at that point, to be honest. I was pretty much in the midst of the grief. And then when I um, did find human design, it was um, the beginning of 2009. I just went down to a lecture in Princeton um, at a wellness center um, and heard my teacher talk. And she's like, at, at the end of it, she said, cause she was actually talking about another book. Uh, and she said, I do this thing called human design. If you want a chart, go get one. And I was like, human design, that just all of a sudden my ears perked up. I was like, oh, this sounds really interesting. So I went to the website, got the chart, got um, a session with her and just really have not left it since. I was just hook, line and sinker <laughs> for human design because it explains so many things about my life after being, as you can imagine, working in New York City all those years, I was uh, completely in a therapist's office almost every week. <laughs> there were lots of things to unpack. And, um, and then after I found human design, all of a sudden all my answers came, right? All of a sudden, it was like, oh, you, I'm okay. You know, I'm not so broken, as I like to say in my little thing. You're not broken. You don't need to be fixed. And right. so just to hear that, it's like so refreshing, right? And this was, you know, 10 years ago now in 2009. So just to be able to hear that, just to be able to hear that I was okay, that I was really here for a purpose, that it really didn't have so much to do with business as it had to do with love. I was like, what? I don't know what that's me. Um, I was like Miss Corporate America, you know, uh, for a long time. And so I didn't know if I could give up that mantle. But yes, see, that, that, is, that is one of the things that attracted me to you because I have a giant skeptic in my brain that is always in any time, anything astrology or um anything that seems kind of out there and woo woo I have this part of my brain I don't want to have that part of my brain and I've been squelching it but that says eh, nothing's preordained and and that just kind of argues with me but right. seeing that you are such a logical pragmatic scientific corporate girl and yeah. that this all of this made sense to you encouraged mm -hmm. me to delve to delve deeper into it as well and yeah. um you know, that I don't think that anyone can predict the future and human design doesn't do that. So that's- it doesn't, It's not a divination tool. Yeah. At all or predictive at all. Right. But, but it allows you to be you, right? Yeah. And, and, the, and the way I was able to prove it, Lauren, I mean, you'll actually laugh. I don't know if you saw this um, or if I said it in the book, but I actually had, I made myself go to all these holistic fairs the first few years I knew about human design because I needed to prove it to myself before mm -hmm. I would even tell my friends and family about it because they know me to be a little, you know, uh, I'll go go into different things and, and research different things and tell them, oh, did you hear about this? Or did you hear about that? And they're like, that, like they didn't want to hear another thing. <laughs> so I was like, I am not going to touch this with a 10 foot pole unless I'm convinced that it works, right? So I went out to all these holistic shows. One year I actually did, even my teacher said, oh my God, you did 25 shows this year? 25 shows, that's like every other weekend, right? I was doing a show um, and this was in addition to my full-time job, right? So it was like the prepping and the pain and the, and, and the being at the show all weekend, but I did thousands and thousands of charts and there was not, and unless they didn't know their birth time exactly for the day, there was nobody who walked away and said, oh, this is crazy. This, is crazy. this doesn't work. You know, they were all like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. And it really, you know, and this is all, even including the women who came with their husbands, to these things, do you know what I mean? Or partners of another kind or business partners, they all said, oh, wow, oh, that makes a lot of sense. Okay. Because so, so, I got to talk to them all for five or 10 minutes. So tell us I what your design is. Everybody's going, okay, what is it? What is it? What is it? <laughs> After all this, right? What is it? It is, uh, so it is a personality assessment and I, I use the word tool for lack of a better word, but it's really a personality assessment awareness so it's an awareness of you and how you are what what how your energy is consistent in your body all the time and the the funny thing is it's based on quantum physics it's also based on biogenetics and modern math that's on the modern side and then on the, the 
what I call the ancient side. We've got the I Ching, um, both astrologies, Eastern and Western. We've also got the, um, the chakra system and the Judaic Kabbalah, which I, I really like that it's also based on the, the Kabbalah and um, which is, uh, it's actually the tree of life. If you look at it, it's the tree of life upside down. And so, yeah. Didn't know so that's pretty cool, that. right? Yeah. And then the chakra system, right, all the way through. And in 1791, we know that in addition to the seven chakras, which we all talk about, we actually got to nine chakras. And that's why we talk about it as nine energy centers, because the heart separated into the identity center and the will, basically. And then the, the, the fears and the emotions also separated. So what we call the solar plexus in, you know, colloquial terms, is the fears and, and emotions, we actually separated them out and that's what's on both sides here. And so it's a, a different way of looking at it than, than just the chakra system, but it really works. And each of those nine centers has a different vibration. And from this, we can find exactly how you interact, actually who you are energetically, right? But then how you interact with other people, which is the real, you know, that's the real bonus with human design. So you get to see who you are, but then basically you also get to see how everybody else is reacting to you and how you're reacting to them. And so whether it's a partner or a romantic partner or to your children or your parents or anybody in your circle, you're gonna react differently with them. And we all know that, right? You meet somebody and you're like, oh gosh, I could have, you know, why didn't we meet years ago? You're so, you know, you're so wonderful. I love being with you. It just feels so good, right? That's what we say. Yeah. Whereas some other people we say, oh gosh, you know, I'm sorry, I have to I have another appointment. I got to get going, right? And only because the energy doesn't feel good. Right. Or, or the other funny thing is the energy feels exactly the same. So if you meet somebody who has exactly the same centers that you have colored in, these, these uh, different colored centers colored in, it's not gonna feel so good. Which again, does the uh, similarities kind of repel and, and, and the opposites attract, right? So most people who are emotional are attracted to people like me who are not emotional because they like that I'm kind of cool, calm, and collected, right? Right. Not emotional either, um, but some people are emotional. And so they have this wave that goes up and down and up and down. And to be honest, just being able to explain that to people is a huge gift. Yeah. Because yeah. people don't realize they're emotional and they wonder why they act the way they do. Okay, so um, I think this is a good time then tell me if I'm wrong to um, describe the different, the five different energy types. And then I have, I have a great example from my life that I want to share after. Okay, cool. All right. And I'm not going to do them in great detail because you can find the information on the internet and a lot of, uh, on my website and a lot of other websites. And I do a videos on my website, by the way, of, of each of these, and they're just short, like two to five minutes. Yeah, so let me interject here so that wh wherever you're watching this, if you're watching it on Facebook or YouTube or listening to the uh, podcast, just look below and we'll share all this information, all the links in the comments or in the show notes or somewhere nearby, there will be links that you can get to Karen easily and get your chart done. It's so cool. So yes, and, and the charts are always free on the website. Mm -hmm. So don't hesitate and get yours, get your husband's, get your children's, get whoever you want. Uh, they're all free. Right. Um, so the five different energy types are, uh, I usually start with the first one, which is the manifester, that uh, they're um, only eight or 9% of the population and they're here to start things. They're here to get things started, whether it's a project or a business or a community event or things like that, they get things started. They're the, we call them the initiators. Uh, as well as the manifestors. The next two types are the generators and manifesting generators. Together, they're 70% of the population. So that's the majority of us. I happen to be a generator, a pure generator. And so the difference um, or the similarity between the generators is that they all have this red sacral colored in and that gives them the energy to basically go and go and go. And so in old times, we were the farmers, we were the factory workers, we were the laborers. We basically have built the countries all around the world um, and done it you know, for many, many years. Um, and uh, the uh, difference is that the generators do not have throat energy, or at least it's not connected to a motor. And the manifesting generators do have throat energy. It's connected to a motor. It gives them the ability to speak um, at least clearly, loudly enough and if they needed to yell across a playground they could <laughs> it's those kinds of people or or raise their voice in a restaurant or a bar to get a, uh, you know get whatever they want those those are the manifesting generators 
and generators tend to be a little more quiet that we try to talk, <laughs> we try to be heard, but it doesn't always work. Um, and, but they, they both have a lot of energy every day. And then there's the projectors. They're about 20% of the population. That's what Lauren has, happens to be. And projectors are here to be wise and to guide and direct the energy of others. And they're really very wise people. They have the answers to almost everything. They're really good consultants and architects and um, salespeople and uh, teachers, professors, uh, because they have that wisdom. And then the last type are um, reflectors and they have, a, of all these energy centers, it's all white on their chart. So they literally are only 1% of the population and they're reflecting back to us whatever is in our environment. And so they kind of help us tell whether a community is healthy or not. So they have a, a very different role, um, but they play it well. Right, okay. So um, five types. as a projector, so I only have two energy centers that are filled in at all. So basically this means that I just don't have a lot, of, I don't have energy to spare. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that I, I need to be really selective about how I spend my energy. So there's I, I have a friend who comes here to help me around the house. And mm -hmm. um, one night she stayed here overnight with my dogs while I was off doing something. And I called her the next morning. She said, oh, I didn't even sleep. I just pilled around and watched TV. And I was just flabbergasted. I would have been destroyed had I stayed up all night. And she does this all the time. She goes and goes and goes and here and there. And her chart is lit up all over the place. She does have the big energy center and she's got lots of other um, areas that are colored in. Again, I'm, I'm talking in very kindergarten mm -hmm. terms <laughs> as much as what I understand but we we mm -hmm. so enjoyed and and you know when I told her what I knew about her chart she's like oh wow yeah and she was she was going to go to your side and check out more stuff too because uh -huh. it's yeah and great and what was cool is she's like I I love that you see this in me and that you appreciate this in me you know yes. that you yes and so it it helped our relationship just to know that she has the energy so I didn't feel guilty about you know having her mm -hmm. do things and, you know, I could appreciate her. It's just, it will help your life in a lot of ways mm -hmm. is the thing. Yeah, and, and actually to that point, I, I mentioned the five different energy centers or, or sorry, energy types. Um, but what's different about each of those energy types is that they each have their own decision-making strategy. And so this is the, the, well, there's three things with human design that everybody will understand or at least start to understand once they get their chart is that first of all, you have all different energy centers colored in, which is your energetic blueprint. Let's call it that, right? It's an energetic blueprint. This is how you operate and what you what people feel from you. Then there's um, the decision-making strategy, which if you, you probably had, you know, if you're, if you're more than 20 years old, let's say you probably have an inkling as to what that is and you probably figured it out. And um, in fact, young people are very good at using their, their guts because that happens to be the strategy for a, a bunch of people. And so uh, the decision-making strategy that will help you make decisions going forward. So you may have known about it, you might've wondered about it, but now you'll know for sure. And then you can make those decisions all the time using that strategy, which makes a big difference for people, right? You can, you can follow the breadcrumbs and try different things, but being knowing for sure that that works, having confirmation that that works is a big deal. And then the other piece is your life's purpose, because once we, if, if we talk or if you, you know, talk to somebody else, you'll be able to get into more depth with your chart. I like to say that if we had time and wanted to sit on the beach and have a drink, we could talk about your chart for 10 hours because that's how much information is in there. But the basis of it is your decision-making strategy. And if you know your decision-making strategy, that can change your life alone. So um, is, that, is it so like the manifesting generator? That's what's popping into my head because my, my best friend is that and also the the friend I was just talking about what is their decision making strategy so their the manifesting generator would have a decision making strategy that's a little more um well for the let's say for the peer generator it's just listen to your gut or wait to respond to something in your outside reality for the manifesting generator it's a few more steps it is listen to your gut but then they should kind of envision, reprocess, figure out who needs to know what they're going to be doing once they decide with their gut what to do, and then inform those people. Not to get approval, not to get, um, um, you know, not to get the permission, but also, but just to let them know so that they don't get upset with them. <laughs> because manifesting generators are usually doing a lot in a day, and so they need to let the people know 
who who would be affected by the decision. Right. I, I love and, and act. So they have a few more steps, but because they're manifesting generators, they can do them quickly. <laughs> right. Yeah. In your book, it said so that those people can either help or get out of the way. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> I love it. That's awesome. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I tend to be pretty um, blunt sometimes, um, but um, but people like that, you know, because I I don't like to, you know go around the bush and, and uh, you know, make uh, big proclamations or make believe I'm some kind of an expert or guru or something. I'm not, I'm just very pragmatic. And I just want people to get to the, you know, if you want to get from point A to point B, I'll tell you the fastest way to get there. Right. <laughs> That's and, what I like to do. And you're getting all of that from the chart. And so yeah. that, okay. One of the, one of the parts of our course, I'm, I'm in care, one of Karen's current courses and I was doing some of my homework this morning <laughs> and um, we were talking about, um, or you were talking about homogenization and differentiation. And I think that the blue pill and the red pill, I think that's just fascinating. Can you, can you share about that a little bit? Well, so we all, you know, whether you look at the educational system or uh, basically any societal system that exists, mm -hmm. we are all taught to be the same okay. and we are not the same. We might all be part of one big, you know, think of it as the, a big circle. Um, actually, I saw somebody um, describe it the other day that we might all be part of this one big circle, but the 3.1417 pi, it, it goes on and on to infinity, uses every combination of numbers. Did you know this? And every single telephone number, social security number, address, everything is in there and it doesn't repeat. It never repeats. It just is always unique. And so that's what we are. We are always unique. Each one of those little digits is, is us and we're totally unique. And it just goes on and on and on and on. And, and there's no two people who are alike. I actually, you know, because my husband and I are so nerdy, we actually ran the, um, the numbers one night and we came to 3.5 billion different combinations on this chart alone, just from what I'm pointing at in terms of gates and channels and the different energy centers and things like that. And so the, the probability that you're gonna meet the one other person in the world who's exactly like you, unless it's your twin, is, is pretty rare. Right. 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 And so we're all unique, but we're raised to think that we all should be doing this or we all should be doing that, or we should be the Nike just do it people, or we should be following Tony Robbins and, and you know, just getting up every day and pushing forward and, you know, you know, everybody devil be care, devil may care kind of attitude. That doesn't work. It doesn't work for everybody. It works for some people, but it doesn't work for everybody. And it certainly doesn't work for me and you, <laughs> for sure. Right, Lauren? Right. <laughs> so there are lots of different ways to get what you want. And so with this, you know, knowing your chart, knowing a little bit more about you, we can find out exactly who you are, what what would be best for you, and then figure out the awareness that allows you to decondition what you've learned, right? Because that's what happens. The deconditioning occurs from early on. As soon as you're in the cradle, <laughs> your mother's saying, oh, don't cry, don't cry. Well, <laughs> babies are supposed to cry. <laughs> there you go, that's your first conditioning, right? Right. And so what, what we need to do is learn to be ourselves in the moment, without the conditioning that we've been conditioned to have all our lives, whether, and, and you know, everybody was well-meaning. I always like to, you know, say that as a caveat. Our parents are usually, you know, our parents are teachers. And I say usually because some parents just <laughs> shouldn't be parents anyway. Yeah. Um, but, but there's uh, the parents, the teachers, the friends, the, the, you know, everybody you come in contact with in the first 20 years is trying to give you some advice, right? But they don't know you. They don't know who you are. And they don't know if you're a red, blue or, red pill or a blue pill, right? They don't know if you're, um, what did you call it? You know, you, you don't want to be homogeneous. Most people, well, everybody I know doesn't want to be homogeneous, right? We all want to be a little bit different. And maybe it's because we get to this golden age, right? <laughs> of wanting to be ourselves and we realize it's okay. But but the, the homogeneity within the um, society is tamping all of our real genius down. And it's a shame. And it's got to change. And I think that really part of what's going on right now is that homogeneity is going out the window because mm -hmm. those of us who 
know a little bit, who can help other people, who can um, uh, help them through, guide them through this period. Um, also be aware, be an activist, be, a, um, be, be talking, just be having discussions with people so that we realize that this is, it's all gonna be okay. This is just what we needed to go through. The earth needs to heal a little bit, but so does society. And there are a lot of, you know, it, I'm not gonna get political, but there are a lot of things that aren't working that need to be, that come to the surface. And they're coming to the surface now. And so it's, it's really up to us, you know, to know who we are, know our values, know what's important to us, right? Stand in our value and then allow ourselves to take the steps that we need to take so that we can help whoever we can. Yeah, I've been in our class, you called, um, I, I don't know, are you hearing that audio or is that just me? It was I don't hear anything. Okay, um, you are the, the, you called us way showers and light workers, which I thought was just awesome. The people that are they're showing the way, and and I do think that we are, as a species, figuring out that life's too short not to be who you are. Life is too short to spend your time trying to be what someone else wants you to be, and mm -hmm. so that realization is like the most important step. But then you're helping us to actually do it, to actually yeah. figure out who that who that person really is and how we can step into being that mm -hmm. person and it's it is so freeing and so empowering to to look at things in this way and I, I want this for everyone you know yeah exactly <laughs> and me too you know and that's why the more I can spread the word the more podcasts I can do or courses I do or whatever you know uh, that's that's just my mission is to let people know how wonderful they are how they were born perfectly nothing has changed and how they can really live into who they are and, and really learn it. It's, it's interesting because once you know who you are and you know who you want to be, there's not one of my clients who doesn't say, oh, how can I help other people with this, right? right. Because mm -hmm. once you're really okay with who you are, you realize there's a lesson there for other people, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you've gotten to this age or any age at this point, really, right? You have probably learned a few lessons, right? And you're ready to teach other people. And so, you know, most of my clients are teachers, most of my, um, and they may not know it, right? But they're teachers of a sort, right? Or as you say, way showers or light workers, however you wanna talk about it, but we're here to help other people. That's really why we're here. We're here to be joyful. We're here to grow. We're here to um, be, so what is it? It's growth. It's, it's the growth that leads to freedom. I like to say, and this is from the Abraham Hicks philosophy, mm -hmm. but basically you grow you get to a point of freedom, whatever that is, whatever type of freedom you're looking for. And then that brings joy. And then you grow again, right? And freedom again, <laughs> different kind of freedom. And then a different kind of joy because the joys you had in, when you were 20 are a lot different than the joys you have later on in life, right? Whether it's children or grandchildren or your career or your pets or your neighbors and friends and family it all changes over time. I talked to a, an 80 year old friend of mine the other day who is holed up in his apartment in New York, God bless him. He's on a fifth floor walk up and he's having hip problems. But he said, Karen, I've never been happier in my life. I've never been more content because he's got his artwork. He writes poetry. He's um, a brilliant artist. In fact, this actually, this is one of his paintings um, behind me. And um, which he made for me. And he's, he said he's so content because he's surrounded by his, his books and his art and his, his um, uh, poetry. And he is ret only retired for five years. He was a professor at NYU, and, and, but he's loving his life. And that is just so, so good to hear. And we've been friends for a long time. And so it's just fun to, to keep in touch with him and see how he's doing and tell him to breathe. <laughs> <laughs> keep breathing Steve and doing his exercises and drinking more water because you know at 80 years old you, you tend to not drink as much water and things like that so anyway it's just fun to be in conversation with people who are still alive and vibrant and getting through this right yeah and that, that, that is so exactly the message that we that we, we're trying to spread here at be happy first is that you can be happy anywhere in any circumstance in any situation yeah. if that's what you choose you um, should interview him lauren yes i think i will <laughs> remind me to hook up with him yeah it's amazing um 
so you brought up our, our one of our mutual favorite teachers, Abraham Hicks, and I know that um, you you incorporate the law of attraction into your coaching and your teaching and things like that. How does do. that how does that tie in with the human design approach? Well, I mean, I had been studying human, um, I'm sorry, I've been studying law of attraction for 10 years when I heard about human design. So my very first question after I was talking with my teacher was, does this work with the law of attraction? And she said, yes. And I was like, thank goodness, because if it doesn't, I, I might have to say goodbye right now <laughs> because the law of attraction was working for me in my life. And I was really happy with the results. And so, um, so yes, it works beautifully with this because it, in fact, that, um, the big yellow diamond in the middle is all about attraction. This is literally the love and direction center, self-love and self-direction center that we all attract into, um, whether it's colored in or not on your chart. So I know yours is not colored in, mine is, Lauren, but whether or not it's colored in, that's your source of attraction. That's the, in, in our parlance, we call it the magnetic monopole, but it's only attracting. It doesn't repel right? It only attracts. Right. And so you get to decide what it is you want to attract into your life. And it works beautifully with human design. And so what I suggest to my clients is that they make lists as you would, you know, um, the shopping list, right? Um, make a list, 10, 12 items at the most in a particular area of your life, whether it's career or relationship or a prospective relationship that you'd like to get into make a list, just 10 or 12 items. What do you want that to look like? What do you want it to feel like? How will you be in that relationship or that, that new job or new career? And, and then, and those are all qualitative items, right? So it's going to, it's going to feel wonderful. I'm going to be appreciated. The hours are flexible. I'm making enough money. And when it gets to the money, I don't like to use numbers. Tony Robbins hates this, but I don't like to use numbers. I don't think the universe answers numbers. <laughs> um, who has ever asked for a million dollars and just seen it drop right in? It doesn't happen like that. Right. But it can happen if you want to be abundant, right? So you say things like, I want to have enough money to cover my expenses, to put money into the business, to put money away for savings, and to do the things I want to do, right? With whether it's my partner or my friends or whoever. And the, that's that's an abundant feeling, right? That's an, when I have all that, I'm feeling abundant. When I have good friends, I feel abundant. When I have good, um, good food or wine, I feel abundant, right? Um, when I, it's, you know, a good meal, you feel abundant. And so it's in air and water and, and the trees, you know, being out in nature. That's just, those are feelings of abundance. And many of them you don't even have to pay for. So you want that feeling of abundance to come into your life and into your qualitative list so that you're feeling that all the time. Now, we oh, all know yeah. that our vision yeah. has to be specific. And, and but now I'm going to rethink this because as you were talking, yeah. if, if I'm not assigning a number to my abundance wishes, then mm -hmm. the universe knows what I want. The universe knows what is what is beautiful and the universe knows what everything costs. Right. So, exactly. so why why do we have to, um, I, I don't know, it's almost like limiting. It's almost like- Yeah, oh, it is limiting. Oh, my stuff comes out a lot better than I write down. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> was, and that was one of my biggest ahas from this process. I'm like, oh, wow, the universe is even better, you know, better at this than me. I mean, when I, when we got to um, Florida, I wanted one balcony, right? I got four balconies. <laughs> so who could, who could have imagined, right? Right. We have a lovely place. I look at more trees than I ever did in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And so this is, you know, and who would have thought, right? <laughs> in Florida, I thought of it as one, you know, kind of flat plane. Um, but I, I found two things as I'm using this, um, these, uh, lists that I do. One is that the universe knows you better than I even know myself, or it knows me better than I even know myself, right? And really knows what I want. That it's also good at timing. So the timing is really good with the, with the law of attraction when it comes to the universe and what it brings you. And so it does bring you things that are actually better than what you imagined. The other piece is that we have this you know, it's a cultural thing, but we have this feeling that the money has to come from the work that we do. 
And I'm here to tell you, the more I let go of it, the more the money came in from other places had it nothing to do with me, nothing. And I mean, to this day, I'm still, I still don't know where some of it came from, but it came. And so, it, you know, it, it's just the weirdest thing. And so, you know, just like 401ks that I'd forgotten about that, you know, the, the company decided to, um, you know, this was the weirdest one because I, I happened to, um, had, had paid for a bunch of those uh, holistic fares, just for example. And I was really, uh, I had to pay off those bills because we had just moved. And I knew I had to pay them off. And I was just like, wow, it would really be nice if something came in. All of a sudden, my employer from New York from 2001 that I left, I should have been getting like, and this is, I'll just say the numbers because it's just kind of weird. But I was supposed to be getting, when I, whenever I retired or after 65 years old, I guess, um, $150 a month because we'd only been, uh, gotten, I'd been there a long time, but we had only been merged with that company for a few years. So the, the, the pension wasn't much. Right. Um, right. And uh, so it was supposed to be $150 after um, 65. And I was only what, 50 something at that point. We got, they said, um, we're gonna give you, and I'll tell you in excess of $50,000 cash. <laughs> And this came in the mail, Lauren, and I looked at the number and I showed it to my husband and he's like, what are they crazy? <laughs> but they just, so this is why things don't happen strangely. And, and, you know, Abraham Hicks tells us stories like this too, where, you know, they had a little piece of land and somebody wanted it and they paid this ridiculous amount for it. And she's like, it's just a driveway. You know, <laughs> what are you paying for? So, so things like that will happen. And guess what? That amount was just what I needed to pay off the bills. Like within a thousand dollars to pay off. Yeah. Even after taxes, even after I paid the taxes, everything was good, everything got paid off. So you can't make it up, right? You can't make up this stuff. When it works, it works and it works beautifully. And so I'm just a big proponent of it. And I'm just like, just let it go, let it be. You know, and it doesn't mean you're not ever going to get tense again. It doesn't mean you're not ever going to get anxious again. But the more, you know, um, I think they say that the more you're on the 50% or, you know, like one side of it than the other, right? The more often you can do that, the better. So um, right? it's like stretching a muscle. Yeah. And right? so, yeah, exactly. Um, and I just, I just love everything that you say. And so I, I want you to say everything that I believe in your words, because you put things beautifully. Um, oh, thank you. <laughs> um, so we're, we're talking about the, the difference between trusting that the universe has your back and feeling like you got to go out and be scrappy all the time. Mm -hmm. um, so I was a hard worker. I worked really hard most of my life, like yeah. from seven years old, we had a tree business. My father had a tree business on the side. I was working from seven years old. I thought that's how you made money. That's only how you made money was to work. And that nothing wrong with work. All you manifesting generators yeah. out there running. Your... <laughs> no, I'm still in favor of work, but. Yeah, but so, so work that feels inspiring, work that feels yes. fulfilling, work that feels um, connected with who you really are. Mm -hmm. And being in a place of allowing all the abundance and feeling deserving of all the abundance. Well, and, that's the other piece. Yeah. yeah. So how how do we? That so that, that I can just picture a lot of people going, ah, that would never work for me. Mm -hmm. how, how how do you teach your clients to have the that feeling of worthiness, that feeling of deserving? Mm -hmm. Well, and it, it does show up in the chart. You know, there are some people who do feel um, as if they are worthy, um, kind of from the get-go, they have the confidence, they have the ego, um, but those would be, would be people who have this um, little red, uh, red, little red triangle filled in, that's the will center. Um, I call it the will center, some people call it the heart center or the ego. I don't like to say people don't have a heart, so right. <laughs> most of us do have a heart. So I like to call it the will center, but it's all about willpower and ego and self-worth and money. And so for those of us who don't have it filled in, which is about six, uh, two thirds of the population, don't have it filled in on our charts. And so we don't come in feeling worthy. We don't come in feeling like we have self-esteem, like we're confident. It, it takes a lot to build us up. 
But once you can realize that you don't have anything to prove, Lauren, you really don't have anything to prove. You don't have to prove you're a good mother or a good sister or a good daughter or, or good employee, good student, none of that. You don't have to prove it. You are worthy, you are valuable, you do come in with this worthiness and there's nothing you have to do to prove it. And so once you can realize that, then you can start setting boundaries. So it's kind of a two-step process. So first you start feeling worthy and you don't have to, that you don't have to prove anything, but then you wanna set boundaries. Because what happens with people with the open will center when it's white on your chart, it, what it means is that it's easy for people to ask you to prove yourself, right? So whether it's your parents or your siblings or your teachers, you always feel like you're proving yourself as a kid. And so you don't feel deserving, right? You don't feel that worthiness and then you don't set boundaries. And I think that the not setting boundaries is really catching up with a lot of people. It certainly, you know, it, it was a, the bane of my existence for a long time because I had a hard time setting boundaries. I always felt like I had to prove myself. I was the type who, once I was making money, I was buying presents, Christmas presents for everybody, birthday presents, you know, sending flowers, doing this, but just trying to prove my worthiness, you know, as a friend, as an associate, as a client always trying to prove something, you know, and even my parents would say, what do you get us all these presents for? We don't, you know, you don't have to get us these things. My father even returned a bathrobe once. He's like, I don't need this fancy bathrobe. <laughs> Cause I was working in New York and I could buy the fancy bathrobes, you know? He said, like, I don't need this to, get, to stop spending your money on, on things that we don't need. So it was, you know, like over, overdone, right? Too much. But what does that prove? Just that I had the hole in me that just meant that I had to keep proving myself. So, so it's really good when you start feeling you're worthy, you'd stop buying the, you stop buying the presents. <laughs> you, could, you, could that up. you stop buying all the presents. You stop showing up at all the birthday parties that you really don't want to be at. You go to the events that you really want to be in you stop showing up for the chamber of commerce things at seven o'clock in the morning that you really don't, don't believe you're going to find anybody that you really want to talk to anyway. Right. Um, I would show up at all those seven o'clock, 7 a.m. chamber of commerce meetings, you know, where you had to get up at five o'clock to get ready to go to travel to them. And I was miserable being there. And you know what? People could tell <laughs> I've got a poker face, we, or I guess I don't have a poker face, right? I, I don't play poker. So people can tell what I'm thinking, right? So if right. I showed up at seven o'clock and I wasn't happy, you could tell. You could tell. <laughs> and who's going to want to meet you? So, so um, I, I, it really has plus boundaries. This thing with boundaries comes up with my clients a lot. And, and I, I kind of have some confusion myself. So what I just heard was, you know, saying no to things that you don't want to do, that that makes sense for a boundary. But sometimes it feels like, um, when you talk about setting boundaries, you're talking about dictating the behavior of other people. No, 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 just your behavior. Okay. So, no, so that's all we have. We only have control over our behavior. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> and so, yeah, no, it's just, it's saying yes when you mean yes and saying no when you mean no. Okay. That's the way I like to put it, right? That you really are just being authentic and saying no. And of course you can say it as nicely as possible. Mm -hmm. If you don't want to, that's okay too. But it, you can come up with ways of saying, no, I'm so sorry, I can't make those cupcakes for the church event on Sunday. I, I just don't have the time. I'm so sorry. I'll, you know, get me next time. And then the next time comes and you say, I'm sorry again. <laughs> if that suits you, you know, and then once in a while, you're going to want to make the cupcakes. Right. But why do you, you know, why do we have to feel like we have to make the cupcakes every single time? It's just, it's, we're not going to save the world with the cupcakes. Right. 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 And meanwhile, you're usually putting yourself at some risk, right? Because either you're not doing something for your family or yourself or your work that you really did want to do. Right. So it's, it's a, it's a balancing act. You, right. you can do the pieces that you feel good doing. Right. And that's, that's the biggest thing. I just tell people, figure out what it is you really like to do. Do that. When you do that, you're being yourself, you're being more authentic, and then everybody gets to see how happy you are, right? Because that's the path to happiness too, or contentment, or fulfillment, whatever you want to call it. Right. If you're doing what you really want to do, and not only will you be happy doing it, you'll be making money doing it. 
because the money can flow a lot more easily into a happy vessel than a not so happy vessel. Right. One of my other favorite um, Abraham Hicks quotes is that there's no happy ending to an unhappy journey. So, <laughs> yeah, we think that if we're trudging through and, and making our way and doing our work and being miserable through it, you know, and many of us can actually be miserable in our jobs and still keep going every day. We have the energy to do that. But, excuse me, for the most part, you would either be in something that you weren't really supposed to be in, and you might be taking somebody else's job, right? Somebody else's seat who really should be there. You really would love doing what you're doing, right? right? Whereas and then you can go off and do what you really want to do. I never thought of it like that. That's a great thing. So stop doing what you don't like doing and make room for somebody that will like doing exactly. Yeah. And go and do it. You know, it's the same um, premise as cleaning out your closets, right? So that more can come in or, or, or leaving room for the, the prospective romantic partner, right? So that there's room for them to come in. It's that same idea. Making welcome. Yeah, I mm -hmm. love it. Okay. All right, cool. So let, let's review what for, go to the link below and get your free chart because it's fascinating. And then she'll also, when she sends you that, she'll send you all kinds of free resources to study up on what your energy type is and to learn more. And then if you're just completely fascinated and, and want to become your most amazing person, go ahead and have a session with Karen. You will love it. <laughs> And, yeah, Thanks, and get get connected with her because she's she's yeah she, I've said it before I'll say it she's my new favorite person and my <laughs> my new guide and my life coach and I I think five times to oh I'm gonna write this down and ask Karen oh, I'm gonna write this down and ask Karen <laughs> <laughs> and see what my chart says about this yes all right and your chart has a lot of answers in it yeah all the answers right yes yeah that's yeah. my perspective. I can't wait to learn more. All right. Yes. So is, is there anything else that you want to add before we wrap it up for the day? Any, anything we forgot to talk about? No, I think, I think we um, covered a lot, but uh, you know, I would just say that um, everybody's unique and we all have a purpose and we all have a story that we can really kind of dive into and, and make our lives much more um, exhilarating, happy, fun, um, all the good stuff. Uh, we don't need to, labor the way we've been laboring it's it's an old prospect from the 20th century 18th and 19th centuries to be honest yeah. 18th 19th and 20th now we're in the 21st century it's time for a new story new story awesome i love it so so very much okay so again thank you karen for being here with us it's livingbydesign.com no living by human design Dot com. Dot com. Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you, Lauren. All right. Thank you. And we're going to be back next week with another of my fellow authors. Um, her name is escaping me at the moment, Sarah. <laughs> Sarah Lascano is going to be here with me next week. And remember on the 20th, you want to be ready to pay 99 cents for your exclusive Kindle copy of The Art and Truth Transformation for Women, along with all those gifts that are going to be there. And I'm going to see you back here real soon. In the meantime, remember that happiness is a choice and you can always choose to be happy first. See you later.